live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about the biggest black hole in the universe. Ah! and various associated horrible noises and of course taking listener questions about all things in the universe because that's what this show is about we record every thursday at 8 p.m eastern and you can follow along online or leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com and in today's blue shift i'll be catching up with the space cadets but first the news Hey, space cadets, welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent of the stars. We've got an amazing show for you today. I can't believe it. I can't describe it. So I'm not going to. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along with our live our space cadets tuning in live from around the world. F including, but not limited to, Denver, Colorado, Orange County, Christchurch, New Zealand. Someone making some reference to Brexit, uh, London, UK, Marysville, Washington, Howell, New Jersey, Germany, Halifax, England, Hutto, Texas, Portsmouth, UK, Cumnor, Texas, and Galway, Ireland. Galway, Ireland, isn't there a massive dark sky preserve or park nearby, if I remember right? The southeast, southwest part of Ireland is supposed to be, have amazing dark skies. I'm very, very jealous. Anyway, go to spaceradioshow.com to get links to the show, to catch up on the live streams, to see the podcast if you prefer to consume this episode on your own time. And seriously, folks, I've only prepped 10 minutes to show material tops, so get those questions in. Oh, boy. Illinois, Canada, BC, Canada, sorry I missed you on the Twitch stream. I'll catch you next time. Twitchers. Is that what you're called? Twitchers? Twitchies? Twitcheroos? Twitch nights? I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to do voicemails and I'm going to do tons of Space Get Out questions. Don't worry. Oh, news. Yeah. What what am I doing? I'm I'm all over the place. I'm all jittery. It's all exciting. Yep, yep, yeah, timer, here we go. Before I start taking questions, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And hey, it's a big black hole. We haven't talked about black holes here in a while. It's been at least two weeks since we've talked about black holes. Now, this is a big black hole. This black hole has the name of J2157. And when are we going to get around to naming supermassive black holes after mythological demons and monsters and creatures of the underworld and nightmare fuel? I think that's a better, I think that's a better thing to do than like J2157. That's boring. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I'm not in charge of naming things. I should just move on. This thing's big. It is 34 billion times the mass of the sun. That is 8,000 times bigger than the black hole found in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. By the way, if you didn't know, it seems like every galaxy hosts a big black hole, including the Milky Way. Ours is called Sagittarius A star. It has nothing to do with star. The star is an asterisk. Again, They could have called it Methuselah. No, not Methuselah. uh, Beelzebub. That would have been great. Some great demon names for these black holes. That would be more appropriate. No, we get stuck with Sagittarius A star and J2157. Anyway, sorry. I said I wasn't going to rant about the names. Here's a problem with big black holes. This particular black hole, J2157, it is 34 billion times the mass of the sun, 8,000 times bigger than the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. At this Black hole was discovered when the universe was only 1.2 billion years old. And right now it is around 13.8 billion years old. So it was a youngin. Our universe was a toddler when this giant black hole came around. And this is a, a challenging puzzle. It's a very interesting puzzle in astrophysics. Because how do you get black holes to be so big so quickly? We're seeing giant black holes even just a few hundred million years 
into the history of the universe. This one, J2157, is the biggest black hole in that epoch, in that range of like the one to two billion lifetime years of the universe range. That is the biggest black hole we found. How do you get 34 billion times the mass of the sun to appear in a short amount of time? And yes, when it comes to growing black holes, 1 billion years is a relatively short amount of time. This is a challenge because black holes, as far as we know, come from the deaths of stars. So you have to make a star, then kill it, get a black hole, and then the black hole starts out small, like two or three times the mass of the sun, and then starts merging and then starts feeding on gas. We know that black holes can feed and grow and get bigger, but we don't know how they can get so big so quickly. So did they form in another way? Was it direct collapse of matter? Did they skip some stars? Was there some crazy physics happening in the universe? Is there something we don't understand about the accretion of material in the early universe? Is something, are we getting some details of astrophysics wrong? It's a big open question, but the bare fact remains, our universe has these giant black holes and we don't even know exactly how they got to be so big. The ones that are here, present day universe, they've had enough time to get this big, 13.8 billion years, but it's the early ones, it's the young universe ones like this one, like J2157, this, this portly gentleman over here. We don't know how it got so big. If you got any answers, let me know because it's like a hot topic in research. Uh, that's the latest and greatest when it comes to space, but let's have a conversation. Early universe, uh, Niji is saying early universe black holes were clearly more ravenous than expected. The thing is, uh, there is a limit to how quickly a black hole can feed because the material falls onto the black hole and compresses and heats up and starts emitting radiation and that radiation can prevent more material from falling in. So there's a, a limit, there's a throttle attached to, to growing black holes and it looks like black holes have to go faster than that throttle in order to get this big. That throttle, by the way, is uh, called, yes, thanks, Nancy. I thought you said uh, we are going on hiatus. I'm like, wait, what? I get a vacation? No, 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 no. I'll be around next week. I just, we couldn't do last week uh, because of travel and because the show was getting preempted on the airwaves anyway. All right, we've got a couple voicemails, so let's do that. That throttle is called the Eddington Limit, by the way, if anyone's curious. Should they have gone on the show? Nah. We've got some fun listener questions ready to go. Greg, hey, Greg, wake up. Hey, do that thing where you press the button, okay? Go for it. Hi, Paul. The name is Michelle. I have such a basic question. It's almost embarrassing. I'm really unclear on the difference between planets and stars. All planets are stars, but all stars are not planets. Can you please unravel that in a way that only you can do? Three quick little notes in addition. Do you ever do live lectures at the OSU Planetarium on campus in Columbus? Next, I'm trying to order your messy universe book, I call it, um, from your website, autograph copy. I don't see that as an option. And last but not least, I just think you are dynamite. Watch you every chance I get. So glad to find you um, on the radio show. Love everything you do. I hang on your every word. You're the greatest. Thanks. Bye-bye. No, Michelle, you're the greatest. Greg, We I think we can all agree that Greg is not the greatest. Uh, but in this competition, Michelle, you are definitely going to be the greatest. For your three uh, questions, one, if you're trying to find an autographed copy of my first book, Your Place in the Universe, Understanding Our Big Messy Existence, on my website, I do have autograph copies available of my new book, How to Die in Space, but I don't have autograph copies available of Your Place in the Universe because I sold out. And I'm waiting on a new box of books for my publisher. They will get in at some point, as you can imagine, they're having some warehouse staffing issues. Uh, but once the box comes in, I'll, I'll make it available on my website to buy an autograph copy. If you don't need the autograph, you can go to Amazon. It's still available at bookstores. It's still available on Amazon. You can buy a copy, either digital or hard copy. Uh, the second question, do I give live talks at the Ohio State University Planetarium? That's in Columbus, Ohio. 
<coughs> excuse me, I do not. Uh, I don't live in Columbus anymore. I moved uh, to the New York area about a year ago, and that's where I based the show from. But because WCB FM, 90.5 FM in Columbus is full of awesome people. They still put my show on the airwaves in Columbus, even though it's produced all the way over here in the New York City area. And, uh, uh, but the OSU Planetarium, guys, if you haven't visited your local planetarium or your local observatory, you really should. They're always full of passionate people, interesting people that do awesome star tours that do awesome planetarium shows you really should like you'll get a kick i enjoy going to local planetariums and observatories and and catching a little show it's a nice little break to have someone else do the talking for once Uh, but as to your main question the difference between stars and planets no planet is a star and no star is a planet a star by definition is something that is big enough to ignite nuclear fusion in its core. So this could be hydrogen fusion or helium or or heavier elements depending on the size of the star and the age of the star. But if you are not burning nuclear fuel in your center, you are not a star. Easy peasy definition. Planets are a little bit harder to pin down. Right now we have a definition of planets. They must be round. They must orbit the sun. And yes, there are planets orbiting other stars. Uh, And it must be big enough to clear out its orbit. So we only have eight planets in our solar system and a host of dwarf or smaller planets in our solar system. A bunch of people disagree about that definition, including me. Uh, But that is what it is right now. And so a planet is big and round. basically getting get you started. But once you're big enough and round enough to start igniting nuclear fusion, you get to be called a star. There is a weird dividing line. There is a gray area between the biggest planets and the smallest stars. There's this little overlap region called a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is an object that's way too big to be considered a planet, and we're talking 20 times the mass of Jupiter, and in the initial moments of its life does briefly fuse deuterium in its core, but then that shuts off, but it's definitely way too small to be a star, so there is this third category existing in between the star and the planet known as a brown dwarf. Uh, Some people call brown dwarfs failed stars and some people call brown dwarfs uh, overgrown planets. I'm not going to get into that debate. I have no dog in that fight, but it is a, a third category of object. And then Stars, there are things bigger than stars, but as long as you're burning nuclear fusion in your core, you are a star. And if you're way too small to be round, then you get classified uh, depending on what you are. You could be an asteroid, you could be a meteoroid, you could be a comet, you could be a dwarf planet. Uh, There's a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of things that you could be if you're not big enough to be a planet. So hopefully that answered your question, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Uh, We have to go in a little bit to take a little break, but this show is brought to you by you. That's right, you. I mean it. I mean it every time. It's you and only you. Go to patreon.com slash P-M-S-U-T-T-E-R to learn how you can support the show and we'll see you after a break. And in my book, you're all stars. Except for you, Greg. You're a dwarf planet. Why don't you go hang out with Pluto? Yeah, your friends right at the edge of the solar system. I'm just kidding. I miss you, Greg. It's been a while. We should do lunch the next time I'm in Columbus. Planetary scientists should define the term planet, not astronomers. That's a good argument. Um, planet, Largely planetary scientists generally think Pluto should be a planet. Yes, there are, Edward. Uh, black holes are bigger than our solar system. In fact, this one, the J2157, whatever it is, that one was bigger than our solar system. Guys, I'm going to do a lot of Space Cadet questions today because I feel like I've, you know, I owe it to you. So send those questions in. And let's get started. 
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got so many more Space Cadet questions ready to go. But remember, you can join the conversation by leaving an online voicemail or by joining the live stream with the other Space Cadets. That's spaceradioshow.com. Now, are we ready for the gauntlet? Because I sure am. We've got a lot of questions and somewhat smaller amount of time, depending on how much time I devote to each individual question. So let's get started. Constellation Pegasus on YouTube is asking, Hey Paul, I didn't know that two stars could merge together. Why don't they blow each other up instead of being two stars merged with each other? You're right. In a lot of cases, when stars collide, there is a big boom. This generates something called a luminous red nova. It's a big boom. It's a big flash. Sometimes the stars can be totally disintegrated. There is a lot of energy involved in a collision. For sure. But stars are also big and they're also squishy. They're just balls of plasma. There's no structure. There's there's just gravity holding them together. And so what we think happens in a lot of cases is that the stars merge together. There's a big boom from all that release of energy. A lot of material leaves the system. The stars themselves may even get completely disrupted. But then things settle down and recoalesce and a new object forms and ignites nuclear fusion and it becomes a new star with the combined mass minus whatever left the system. That's a very common scenario that we think. And so, yeah, there's a lot of energy, but stars are also big and very, very squishy. Edward Hinton on YouTube is asking, what's stopping superluminal communication in space? Uh, What's stopping it is all the known laws of physics. Moving on, Campbell Duncan on Twitch is asking, I've been doing the citizen science thing and sharing my cell phone time for a couple of years to search for dark matter with a program, an app called Credo. Do you think it's worth carrying on with the project? Citizen science projects in general are super awesome. I love citizen science projects. I actually uh, briefly, briefly, way back in the day, uh, helped develop the Cosmology at Home program. I I just did it very, very briefly. I didn't write any papers on it, uh, but I was with the research group. It was within my research group. One of the things we were doing was the Cosmology at Home project, and I did it, worked on it for a little bit, and then in between working on other stuff. And it was a citizen science project. I believe it's still operating on computers worldwide. This particular project, Credo, I don't know a lot about it. I suspect it's looking for dark matter by searching for cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are high energy particles streaming in from outer space and they can hit the camera sensor on your phone and trigger uh, a detection in that pixel of the camera sensor. And so this app can monitor for it. Uh, The way I've seen it configured it, with related apps is you plug it in and I turn on the app, it turns on your camera and it just takes data all night long. And then what we have is instead of one big detector like underground, we have millions or even billions of de- small detectors scattered around the globe. It's a pretty cool project. If you're asking, is it worth it? You got to ask if science itself is worth it. Moving on. Oh, oh, Campbell does have a quick follow-up over on Twitch. Are there any other citizen science projects you would like to plug? Uh, I suggest, strongly suggest you go to cosmoquest.org. This is the collection of citizen science projects run by my good friend, Dr. Pamela Gay. These projects do everything from exploring uh, and naming and mapping galaxies to surface features on the moon and Mercury. Uh, it is, it's really cool. I really suggest you go to cosmoquest.org. I'm sure a link will appear in the chat and also in uh, the show notes. And oh, very good. We do have a link also in the chat and it will go in the show notes to Cosmology at Home. Moving on, Matthew Grotke on YouTube is asking, if Planet Nine was a small black hole, what science can we do with it? So there's this hypothesis that there's this object in the outer reaches of the solar system, something like 50 to 500 times further away from the sun than Pluto is, like this thing's far away. 
we think it might be there. Some people think it might be there because of the way it's messing up orbits of some other planets in a region of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt. The most natural thing to do is to call it a planet, but as the years have gone by and we haven't taken a picture of any planets, we're wondering if maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something darker. And the only thing that could it, it could be would be a small black hole, uh, the mass of like 50 Earths or so. This black hole, I believe, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, I believe it'd be the size of a baseball, but it have the mass of 50 Earths or something like that. Uh, we don't know how to produce black holes that are that small because we produce black holes from the deaths of massive stars and you need a big star to make even the smallest black hole. We think the smallest black hole is around three to five times the mass of the sun. Still, it's not completely, totally ruled out. So it's possible if we do have a black, ho black hole in our backyard, what kind of science would we do? Well, can we go throwing things in it? Can we put it in orbit around the Earth? Yes, I know that sounds dangerous, but that, that's, oh no, it would mess us up because it's 50 times the mass of the Earth. Uh, brr, what can we do with it? Uh, we'll have to go in orbit around it. And, and you can visit it if you want to get squished down to be the size of a baseball. Have at it. Uh, Infinite Monkey on YouTube is asking, why are most exoplanet discoveries around endorsed? Because they are so common or it's easier to see in transit? Most exoplanet discoveries are around all sorts of stars, but over the past few years, we've been really targeting M dwarf stars. M dwarfs, that's another name for red dwarf. These are the small stars in the galaxy. We like targeting red dwarfs because they are there are a lot of red dwarfs very, very close to us. All of them are invisible to the naked eye. Uh, but in, in the limit of what you can see with the naked eye, like if you go out on a nice dark sky, a nice dark night, get a clear sky, you can see the farthest you can see is around 1,000 to 1,500 light years. Like that star will be around 1,000 to 1,500 light years away. Within that same volume, there are about 6,000 stars visible to the naked eye. Within the exact same volume, a bubble with a radius of about 1,000 light years, there's around a million red dwarf stars that are invisible to the naked eye. That's a lot. So that's a lot of stars that are really close, which makes them easy pickings for study. So a lot of surveys are focusing on red dwarfs simply because it is the most common kind of star and it's the easiest. If you want to look at nearby stars, you're more likely to find red dwarfs than any other kind. And so you're more likely to find exoplanets around those. Uh, Pavel is asking, how long did it take to negotiate the book title with my publisher? Zero time. That was the title I walked in the door with, and that was the title I came out with. I did. I didn't really like have an intense negotiation. It was just, that was the title of the pitch. Like I want to write a book called how to die in space. And they said, wow, Paul, we want to publish a book. This is Pegasus, by the way. We want to publish a book called How to Die in Space. That's super awesome. And there it is. My first book, Your Place in the Universe, my title for it was You Are Not Special, Our Universe and Your Place in It. My publisher decided to change the name to Your Place in the Universe. It's fine. It's fine. Moving on, uh, Christine is asking, can there be particles locked up in space time? I've got 10 seconds to answer this. Kind of, sort of, yes, but also no, but it's complicated. A chunk of space time is full of something called quantum fields and random particles can appear and disappear within those quantum fields. Does it sound like I'm just making things up right now? Yeah, probably. Anyway, we're almost out of time today on Space Radio, but before we go, it's time for the blue shift. I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is the Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. In today's Blue Shift, I want to get a little bit closer to the space cadets. We, past few episodes, we've been talking about some heavy topics. I've been t listening to lots of caller questions. I feel like the space cadets are a little bit neglected right now, and so I would like to take some time, two minutes and 35 seconds, to answer some more of their questions. Commander Benkai on YouTube is asking, are there naked singularities? We don't think so. A singularity is a point of infinite density. These are what are the centers of black holes. 
black holes are always, the sing these singularities are always wrapped in an event horizon. So that if you want to visit us in a singularity, you can never escape and tell us what you saw. So you have to wonder, is it possible to construct a singularity without an event horizon? Right now, the only way we know of to construct black holes and construct singularities automatically leads to the uh, envelopment of that singularity by an event horizon, but there's no theoretical reason why that's not possible. So we kind of sort of elevated it to a postulate of just saying, you know what, we think that is just a rule of the universe that you can't have naked singularities because we don't know how it would work. We don't know what it would mean. Uh, it, it seems confusing, but there's nothing outlawing it. So we just made up a rule outlawing it. But it's, it's a very interesting field of study. Nancy is asking, could Planet 9 be a dark matter planet that we have not figured out how to detect yet? A dark matter, whatever the dark matter is, and we don't know what it is, we know that it cl doesn't clump up very tightly into dense little balls. We know this because we would have seen it by now. If dark matter, and there's the majority of matter in our universe is dark, does not interact with light, but is still gravitating. So if we were surrounded by planet-sized blobs of dark matter, we would see it affect the background starlight. A little bit of starlight would bend and shift because of the gravity of the dark matter. And just by staring at stars on the sky long enough, we would see these lensing events from all the dark matter that we're just swimming in. But because we don't see it, so we tried this, we don't see it. And so that sets a minimum size on the dark matter blob. The smallest we can figure is that dark matter blobs up to no smaller than the size of a solar system, probably is even smooth at that scale, uh, probably doesn't blob up until you're at the size of galaxies. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by you. Please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can contribute. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the space cadets, and all the fine crew at WCBE Radio 90.5 FM in Columbus for making this show possible. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for all the links, place to answer question, links to the live stream, everything you need. And of course, thanks again, space cadets, for listening. I'll see you next week. And remember... Science is for sharing. End of transmission. Woo! I'm hot. It is summer in my home office, aka Spaceman Studios. It gets a little bit warm, but don't worry. That just makes the cheese taste better. And that's, I've got a good cheese for us. I've got a good cheese for us today. Oh. Thanks, Daddy Ice. Why don't you stick around for some cheese? Today's cheese, Sartori brand, which looks very Italian until you notice there's literally a picture of the state of Wisconsin on the on the logo and some cows in a little boat. Uh, Sartori brand cheese, we've got a rosemary and olive oil Asiago. There's that logo. Do you see like the crest of Sartori? You're like, oh wow, fancy medieval Italian. Oh, Wisconsin. But hey, Wisconsin is an amazing state. I'm not going to knock it. Rosemary and olive oil Asiago. Apparently, this was the first place winner of the World Championship Cheese Contest. Why am I not a judge on that? We don't know. This is reserve. Ooh. Heralded as the dew of the sea. Rosemarinus officinalis provides the perfect savory high note for this rich, nutty, and fruity taste sensation i want to taste sensation so i've got my cheese knife out don't don't watch me open up a thing of cheese it says to keep refrigerated and i did i bought it and i kept it refrigerated but it's been at room temp for a while now so i can get the maximum flavor so, excuse me i just got I just gotta smell this for a while. Wow.
Wow. Look at all that rose. Look at that rosemary. Look at that. Can you see that? It is encrusted in rosemary. There's rosemary in. It is dripping with olive oil. You know, rosemary has that wonderful woody taste. Sometimes rosemary can get a little bit overboard, so I'm a little bit worried. But not very. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Wow. This is good. I love Asiago. I love rosemary. I love olive oil. I love rosemary and olive oil Asiago. This is not a fast cheese. This is not a cheese that you just eat like a machine. This is a nibbling cheese. It's very powerful, but it's very, very smooth. Mmm, that rosemary is a great addition. Asiago itself is very nutty and fruity. Rosemary just adds that lovely layer. And then you've got olive oil just coating the inside of your mouth and your fingers.